Welcome. Well, if you've ever been stressed, led others, felt burned out, had children, or survived a global lockdown, the vagus nerve might be worth your attention. It's often discussed in the PTSD world, but what's the big deal? Well, in short, the vagus nerve plays a vital role in regulating stress response and our overall emotional well-being. It's responsible for the mind-body connection. It helps us to distinguish between pain and suffering, which is a very important subject that we're going to dive into. As someone who believes that everyone we meet is in some kind of a pain, understanding the importance of the vagus nerve and how somebody is responding can help us to connect with others much better and actually improve our own well-being. You're about to discover the power of the vagus nerve and its impact on your life. Stay tuned because our guest for the next two episodes is going to be Dr. Greg Hammer. Welcome to the Dove Baron Show. Come for the stories, stay for the learning. Join the movement of deeply curious learners by hitting the subscribe button now. The Dove Baron Show is not just another podcast, it's your passport to unparalleled insights. Each episode is filled with wisdom of global leaders, scientists, entertainers, philosophers, theologians, and journalists, from astronauts who've traveled the vastness of space to presidential candidates trying to make sense of a world that seems to be on the brink. We dive into the most intriguing minds. Our special guest insights will captivate and inspire you for the next two episodes. Hit that subscribe button right now and become part of a global community today. When it comes to managing stress, look no further than our guest for the next two episodes, Dr. Greg Hammer. He is a Stanford University School of Medicine professor, a pediatric intensive care physician, and a pediatric anesthesiologist. Ladies and gentlemen, turn up the volume and help me to welcome author of A Happiness Handbook, Gain Without Pain, Dr. Greg Hammer. Welcome, sir. Hey, Dov. Great to be with you again. Thank you, sir. Been a while since we chatted, and I'm really glad that we're going to have this conversation. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said, it's absolutely evident to me that the world is more stressful than it was pre-pandemic. And pre-pandemic, let's face it, was the Trump elections. So the fact that things are more stressful, and now we're coming into more of that again, is really a fascinating thing. And it's almost like we're all on this automatic So your book is Gain Without Pain. You talk a lot about stress and stress management. But what's the origin story of what gives your life meaning? Wow, that's a great question, Dov. I would say that, I don't know if it's a story, but it's a theme, and that is life and death. From the time I was little, and I don't think this is rare necessarily, but I was asking myself the big questions as far back as I can remember about what are we doing here, what happens when we die, and so on. And when I decided 10 or 15 years later to go into intensive care medicine and cardiac anesthesiology, I realized I would be dealing with death quite a lot. And that turned out to be true. And so I decided to take this on. You know, people in medicine sometimes say you shouldn't get too close to your patients because it's going to tear your heart out when they don't do well. And I never agreed with that. I always felt that Death is something I need to really stare in the face and learn how to accept it. That's the A in GAIN, which is GAIN is an acronym for gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment, and the basis of of the meditation that I practice and teach. But I felt that I needed to accept death and really bring it into my heart and learn to live with it, and that would give a lot more meaning to my life. But was there some event that made that so profound for you? I mean, I realize working in intensive care is going to do it, but as a general, but is there some moment there for you? I don't think so, Dov. I think it's just that when I did a residency in pediatrics and a residency in anesthesiology and then two fellowships, but during my residency in pediatrics, when I was working in the intensive care unit and I had patients that were dying and who ended up dying, I think the cumulative effect of that on my persona was to really remind me that this is something I really need to absorb and bring into my own consciousness and the way that I look at the world. And so, you know, I think a lot of us, we resist the idea of death. And again, the A in gain is acceptance, which is really the opposite of resistance, if you will. And that you mentioned the role of pain and or the relationship of pain and suffering. There's a formula in my book, suffering equals pain times resistance. So the pain is there. These children are, have, you know, many of them terrible congenital anomalies. They're doing poorly. Many of them will die. 
And that's the pain. The pain is there. It's how we deal with it. Do we resist it and therefore increase our suffering or do we learn how to accept it? So I think it was just my encounters with dying and children and those who actually died that really made it so clear to me that this is something I really need to absorb. And so I have. And then almost seven years ago when my son passed away at the age of 29, it was a good thing that I had really spent so much time dealing with because it really helped me cope with that. And I think, you know, it's a short trip for all of us here and none of us gets out of this alive. And some people are perhaps best off not really thinking about it, but I'm not that kind of person. So it's not a story. I think it's kind of a, a series of stories, but on the theme of acceptance and with death and dying in particular. So you spoke about your son. First of all, dealing with pediatric, for those who are not familiar, means children. Dealing with pediatric, dealing with children who are dying. As a doctor, dealing with death is got to be difficult in and of itself. Dealing with children who you are there and you are aware they're going to die. It's really important, I think, that we need to convey this up front. Is that, as you said, many doctors sort of go to this place of, well, you've got to compartmentalize and block it out and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't make for a better human being at all. And you decided not to do that. And you've decided to look into that place. And I know your book goes into it, and we're going to go there, so we don't need to go into a big conversation about that part right now. But I really want to come back to things are not real until they're real. I say this to people all the time. So you're a Republican congressman, and you're voting against gay rights, and then you find out your kid's gay, and suddenly your mind changes, because it's real. And I'm not condemning or condoning. I'm just pointing out something. It becomes real when it becomes real. You're very much against drugs, and then you find out your own kid is a drug addict. You know, it's like changes your perspective. So it's one thing to get this concept of, I'm dealing with death, even of children, which is tragic. But then your own child, I mean, 29 is still so young. My kids are in their 40s and in their mid-30s. At 29, it would have been, I can't, I can't imagine recovering from that. Talk to us about that part specifically for a moment, if you can, please. Sure. Well, you know, it was a struggle with Max. He was a, a brilliant and very gifted lad and adult. He was a gifted musician. He could sit down at a piano and read a Beethoven sonata sheet music once and then put the sheet music away and play it without anything to remind him of the notes. And he was just such a brilliant guy. It just knew so much about the world, was so well read. But, you know, I think like a lot of brilliant young people and maybe those who are perhaps in the realm or gray zone of bipolar disorder, he was very underdeveloped in some ways and he had a substance abuse problem. So it was a long slog. But of course, you know, when I got that phone call on a Monday morning from the Stanford police, I have a home on Stanford campus and I was on his lease. And so when he was found in his apartment, the Portland police called the Stanford police and they called me and came over and told me what had happened. Your whole world changes at that point, of course. But I found that I was very resilient. And again, you don't know what's real until it's real, as you said. I love that quote. And it became very real. But I was, in a manner of speaking, sort of reassured to know that I was sort of prepared for it in a way. I mean, not only because of his history, but just because of my experience in life and in general, my, my spiritual beliefs, the fact that I had really kind of taken on the concept of dying and death. It's something you can't really describe. That is the feeling when you get that phone call or when you, by whatever means, you find out that your child has died. But, you know, in a way, it just sort of was a step in the relatively short walk of life for me, and I was able to absorb it pretty well. You talk about, as you said, you have this acronym in your book, GAIN, and GAIN Without Pain, and at the same time, you've obviously gone through a lot of pain, and you make a distinction between pain and suffering, as you mentioned a little bit about just a moment ago. Talk to us a little bit more about that resistance piece, because I think, as you know, I studied Buddhism and the Tao and Gnostic and Coptic and, and Kabbalah and other religions, and oftentimes people sort of take on this idea, even with Stoicism, that they're not supposed to feel, that they're somehow supposed to compartmentalize it and block it away, and that's why, so they're Stoic. That's actually not the teachings of the Stoics, and it's certainly not the teachings of the Buddhists. So talk to us a bit about this equation and what it means to you in the simplest form you can for us to grasp it as we listen. 
Yes. Well, the equation is suffering equals pain times resistance. So it's kind of akin to a mechanics formula, and we love formulas in medicine. The pain is there. So when something like the death of a child happens, there is pain. There's no doubt about it. But the suffering is the variable component, or I guess the resistance and the suffering are variable. The pain is sort of fixed. Mm -hmm. And when we, as I've discovered in my life, when we sort of suppress uncomfortable thoughts, or maybe we have a painful episode with another person and we may depersonalize them, or maybe we lose somebody in our family or somebody that we know that we cared for and, and we say, well, you know, they sort of brought it on themselves. They ate too much. They drank too much. They smoked. It's a way of depersonalizing that other person. That's a form of resistance, actually. Yes. And whether we're aware of it or not, that actually only increases the suffering that's associated with the pain. So I think if you think about painful experiences that you've had, let's say you have a physical pain. You know, let's say you kind of blew out your knee skiing. You wake up in the morning and your knee is swollen and painful and you focus your attention on it and you just say, oh, you know, this is just the worst thing. And why me? And a couple of things are happening. One is you're exhibiting your negativity bias, which we can talk about by focusing on that one body part that's not working well in the midst of this miraculous system of human biology that is working perfectly. But the other thing is you're kind of resisting it, but you're asking, why me? You're trying to wonder why this happened to you, and that's a form of resistance. So there's a lot of forms of resisting pain, and they all increase our suffering. So I can't think of an example of a way that we resist something uncomfortable that doesn't magnify our suffering. So to me, that equation, Dov, holds true, that suffering equals pain times resistance. And on the other hand, acceptance, we want to be mathematical about it, I, I, I would posit is one over resistance. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's sort of the opposite of resistance. So if we fully accept the pain in life, we fail to suffer. And I'm not a believer in Christ as the Lord or the Son of God, but I can imagine Christ on the cross with spikes through his wrists and feet and just the physical pain he must have been experiencing, but I don't know exactly how the scripture portrays it. But to me, I think he had fully accepted his lot in life, and therefore he wasn't suffering. So he was experiencing pain, but by dropping his resistance and accepting the pain, his suffering was diminished or possibly even absent. And I think this is a major theme in, like, I didn't make up these principles of gratitude, acceptance, intention, non-judgment. I think acceptance is a widely held important attribute that we can learn to embrace that will decrease our suffering. Nobody gets out of this alive, but before we ourselves die, we're going to experience a lot of pain, for sure. It's really important for people to grasp that we are not, and you can certainly address this, we are not talking about some kind of BS positive thinking. This yes. is not positive thinking. This is not denial. So acceptance and denial are very different, but they get glued together quickly around this idea, well, if I'm going to be in acceptance, and I have to think positively about it. Ooh, oh, now you're skating on thin ice. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I agree with that. No, acceptance does not mean uh, denial at all. In fact, it's really the opposite of denial. Denial is a form of resistance. You're denying something that's true because the truth may be uncomfortable. So you say, well, that's not true. But no, that's a form of resistance. Acceptance is simply, and by no means does this mean that we're looking at life through rose-colored glasses. Again, I would almost say quite the opposite. Acceptance means we come to understand the nature of our existence, and we are mortals, and we are finite, and the world around us is changing constantly. And we learn to accept this, and we learn to accept the fact that the world does not comport with our apparent wants and needs. You talked about stress in the beginning and how this is such a stressful time. I totally agree with that. I mean, things are happening now that I've not experienced in my lifetime, and I would anticipate that you would agree with me. You know, the war in Ukraine, what's happening in Gaza, our unbelievable political divide where people who are friends don't talk to each other because of their political beliefs. Pandemic and its aftermath, what our kids and their kids missed during the pandemic that was part of their essential development that they really can't get back, and all the things related to the pandemic that persist at this time. 
social media, which of course, like many aspects of technology is a double-edged sword. There's lots of great things about the internet and social media, but there's also a lot of harm. There are just so many things. Gun violence. Imagine my current book that I'm writing is about teenagers. Imagine just what's going through a teenager's mind. Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I fluid? Should I wear a bulletproof vest to school today? Is there going to be a planet for my kids and my grandkids, this sort of eco-anxiety? These are all things, Dob, that you and I never even imagined. And so there is a lot of stress, but you know, at the same time, we need to accept it's just like the serenity prayer would have it. Let's put it that way. This is not a new concept. We need to discern between what we can change and what we cannot change in the world. And when there's things happening in the world that don't comport with our apparent wants and needs, we need to determine whether it's something we can influence significantly, whether we choose to influence it, whether we have time, because everything is a trade-off. And if we don't have time or we can't do anything about it, we need to accept it. We need to just take the position that this is part of our life. Life is very imperfect. I am imperfect. I'm neither good nor bad. I'm just a human being. And through this method of acceptance, we can really take a giant step toward a greater realm of happiness. So when we talk about this greater realm of happiness and, and this acceptance, I want to tie in the, the, the biological, the physiological, because I talked about it right at the beginning, which is the vagus nerve. So talk to us about the vagus nerve, what it is, I mean, as briefly as we can, what it is, and the role it plays in maintaining equilibrium or helping us to maintain equilibrium? Well, you know, like all other systems in our body, whether it's our hormonal system or the many different aspects of our central nervous system, that which covers muscle tone, for example, it's a balance. We have motor nerves that regulate our movement that go to flexor muscles and motor nerves that go to extensor muscles. And our resting tone is a balance between the activity of those nerves that would tend to flex our arm and those that would tend to extend our arm. There's a balance. Yes. The autonomic nervous system is another aspect of our nervous system. And it could be called the automatic nervous system because it operates without us having to think about it. So our resting heart rate. Okay, that's a balance between the aspect of our autonomic nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system that tends to accelerate our heart rate and its balancing counterpart, the parasympathetic nervous system that will tend to slow our heart rate. And it's this harmony between sympathetic and parasympathetic that determine our resting heart rate. The vagus nerve is the primary nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. It emanates from a nucleus in the lower part of the brain, this, the so-called reptilian brain or brain stem, and it sends branches to our head, our pupils, for example, the lining cells of our nose and mouth and throat, our secretory glands, our salivary glands, for example, and then branches down our neck to our heart, to the various aspects of our lungs, the lining cells and secretory cells and smooth muscle cells in the lining of our little tubules in our chest going to our air sacs and then down to our abdomen to all of our organs essentially and into our pelvis. So it's a very long nerve and it is again the primary modulator of the parasympathetic nervous system. And so for example, the sympathetic nervous system like adrenaline is the primary hormone of the sympathetic nervous system that makes our pupils dilate. So when we're frightened or alarmed or having this fight or flight response, our pupils dilate. The vagus nerve sends branches to the muscles around the pupils that cause them to constrict. It causes secretions in our mouth, our salivary glands, etc. causes secretions in those lining tubular cells in our lungs, causes the muscles in those tubules to constrict. So it does a number of things, but one thing it does is it slows our heart rate and it gives us a sense of calm. So again, this is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system, the sort of fight or flight response that does the opposite of imparting a sense of calm, right? That's what happens when we're afraid, when we're alarmed, when we're hypervigilant, when we need to decide whether to fight or flee. Those are all excitatory types of phenomena, right? The vagus nerve does the opposite. It's calming, slows our heart rate. And so learning how to consciously activate the vagus nervous system is, is quite a useful skill, actually. Even though it operates with us out having to think about it, we can actually use our brain cortex 
and send impulses down to that vagus nucleus and do something about the vagus nerve and its activity. And, and this turns out to be very important. So let's just sort of summarize that so people can understand. This nerve is, like all nerves, it's there, it's doing what it does because that's what it's supposed to do. However, if you've been in a high-stress situation, that nerve is now likely to not be as responsive as you'd like it to be in the way that you'd like it to be. And so there are ways that you can consciously interact with the vagus nerve. For instance, there are very specific treatments that are medical procedures that it can be done with it. There's treatments involving with Parkinson's, lots of great research around that for those of you who don't know about that. But the bottom line is that gut instinct that you have, that's communication of your gut through the vagus nerve to your brain. And the thing about this is the vagus nerve, if you want to think about it this way, can be massaged. And it can be massaged by the way you breathe and the flexation of your neck as well as your lungs. And so as Greg was just saying here, it goes all the way down. Once you understand that, then you can, and this is why it's important, you can begin to massage that nerve in order for you to relax. So for instance, there is specific breathing that will help you to do that. And Greg goes into that in the book. And we're going to go more into that actually as we get into part two of the show. But for now, when people are thinking about this thing that seems to be invisible to them, seems to be operating without any part of them, and as a result can feel like, I don't have any control over this. What's the message you want people to get before we get into how to? Sure. Well, I'm walking down the hall, Dov, and I'm going to meet with my department chair, and I'm wondering why he or she wants to meet with me, but that's the message I got. So I start to get a little anxious, feel my heart rate going up a bit. My blood pressure is probably going up. My blood sugar is probably going up. These are all part of the fight or flight response. Maybe I'm a little jittery, a little sweaty. I'm anxious. My sympathetic nervous system is being activated. I realize this if I'm aware of my physiology, and I think to myself, oh, yes, I'm experiencing anxiety and sympathetic activation. Why don't I activate my parasympathetic nervous system to calm all these sympathetic responses down? So why don't I activate my vagus nerve? So as you mentioned, there's several ways we can do this, and then there's a whole litany of devices that are on the market, including something that's implantable in our body to activate the vagus nerve, but they should not be necessary. So you mentioned breathing. So we start the GAIN meditation every morning. It can be very brief, three-minute meditation. We start with breathing. So we find a comfortable place to sit. We've opened the blinds. We've got out of bed. We've done our morning hygiene. We find a comfortable place to sit. We start with our breathing. We close our eyes and we slow our breathing. We slow the inhalation maybe to a count of three. We pause to a count of three and we slow the exhalation effortlessly to a count of four. And we repeat this a few times. In, pause, out. And if each count is a second, then that breathing cycle is three, three, and four, 10 seconds. Our respiratory rate is six. So we've slowed our respiratory rate and we've also increase the expansion of our lungs from our usual breath. And when we're anxious, by the way, you know, we can go days without really taking a deep breath. So here we're slowing and intentionally increasing our lung inflation, and this activates the vagus nerve. So we start from a place of calming ourselves down. And this is a very simple technique, our breathing, slow, deep, intentional breathing that is always accessible to us. We're driving our car. We're driving to work. We've done our gain meditation. We had a cup of coffee. We're driving, and there's another driver on the right of us, at least in the U.S., and they decide to change lanes in front of us without using their turn signal, and they kind of cut us off a little bit. Our heart rate starts going up. We start feeling upset and, by the way, making a lot of judgments about the other driver. And then a light bulb goes off and we're reminded first the end and gain is non-judgment. So let's drop those judgments. But we also become aware that we're getting anxious. And so we learn, we go back to acceptance. This is just something easy to accept. Let me initiate slow, deep breathing. My heart rate will come right down. I can have a little laugh to myself that I got upset. A little dopamine hit instead of a little extra adrenaline hit. And I feel so much better. And so 
This is always accessible to us. We can also activate the vagus nerve with cold, either just putting cold like an ice pack on our face or a pack of frozen peas or whatever you have in the freezer. We can also submerge ourselves into cold water or take a cold shower. The initial reaction to which may be activation of the sympathetic nervous system because of the shock of the cold, but that quickly dissipates and then we have a diving reflex and our heart rate slows down beautifully. So deep breathing, cold exposure, uh, ice or, or submerging, and then actually a little pressure on our eyeballs or a carotid artery in our neck. We do this actually when we have a baby or a small child who has an extremely rapid heart rate with an abnormal rhythm called supraventricular tachycardia. We don't press on their eyeballs, but we could press on the carotid artery, and we often will put a cold ice pack on their face. And sometimes this actually breaks the arrhythmia because vagus nerve activity will go to the sinus node in the heart and interrupt that abnormal circuitry of supraventricular tachycardia. So breathing, cold, and then using a little bit of pressure. Fabulous. Well, we're already at the end of part one of the show. I want to make sure that people can find out more about you, about your book. That is, if you're watching us right now, you can see it in the background just over Greg's shoulder. Tell us more about how people can find out more about you, about the book, and where they can get in touch with you and find the book. Sure. Well, the book or just finding out about me, Dov, and then also a way to see our interviews and lots of other ones I've done are at greghammermd.com. G-R-E-G-H-A-M-M-E-R-M-D dot com. And I'm actually, since you mentioned it, I'm in the process of, since I've just retired from clinical medicine as of the end of December, will be really upgrading my website. I've got perhaps a hundred brief articles to upload and be a little bit more active on social media, which I haven't been active in at all before. But yeah, I'm going to try to really expand my teaching and interaction with lots of friends and followers. Okay, you can find all that on Greg's website. And of course, we'll make sure that we post the links to Greg's website and any other social connections that are there so you can find him. We're going to be back in just one click. Stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you are managing your nervous system or is it running you? Stay curious. We'll see you in one click. Click.